So, hi, uh, we are here today again with Richard and Lars, uh, and we wanted to talk now about uh, the future, about the changes, where the innovation comes from now. And I think let's start with uh, why you're working uh, with Lars, because you mentioned yesterday already that uh, they have experience that your older publishers don't have. So, can you tell me about the innovation or the future of Travi on them? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, we've we're one of the few companies in Germany that have been around for for many years. I mean, I think you guys are slightly older <laughs> than we are, just a bit. But uh, but we've been around since 2005 at least. And uh, it, I don't have to tell any one of you that it's kind of difficult to create success after you've had a big success. So Travian obviously was our big title that uh, started as a project during Gerhard, our founder's studies. I mean, he studied biochemistry and all of a sudden he was like, hey, I'm gonna make this, am I gonna make this game because I wanna play something that's not out there yet. And he kind of copied a couple of things from other games that were there, but he wanted to create this unique thing. But that was a very unique environment. And at that point uh, it was, I don't wanna say it was easy, but apparently there was quite was a, an a bit of, there was an opening and it was, it was good. Um, it was relatively easy compared to these days to get people to try it out. It started with like his, um, you know, fellow students and then uh, they talked to friends and so on. And all of a sudden there was like a million players and, you know, you know, the rest of the, of the history pretty much. So um, what we've been trying to recreate ever since is a similar kind of success. And um, some things worked, some things failed. Actually, more things failed than worked. And uh, so for many years, we've been trying to recreate that kind of success. We've been trying to uh, to make games that are similar somehow. We've always been talking about the Travian of the next generation, if you okay. will. And I think just recently, we, we decided that that's probably not the right approach. And uh, so for the last three years, we've been looking into how can we make sure that we innovate but still benefit from the communities that we've built over the last 13, 14 years, because that is quite an asset. Um, and uh, that's why we thought, what is a logical fit? And we decided that one thing that all our games should have in common and had in common in the past is community. So we never made games that you only play for a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of hours and that's it. We always wanted to make games that people can enjoy for a long time. And that's where... Richard comes in and Shroud of the Avatar comes in. That's where Crowfall comes in. And that's where all the other projects that we um, make uh, in our studios or in, in our headquarters in Munich come in um, because that is, if you will, the common denominator. So what we're trying to, to find right now is not the secret sauce because that, I guess, doesn't exist. But we're trying to leverage what we have, the, the players that we know and the feedback we get from them uh, early on, by the way, uh, in, in our development um, processes, and then figure out what we need to do for a modern market, as I usually call it, for people uh, that are not our age, but much younger sometimes, to tailor a game to what they want to play these days without losing the depth that our games offer. Mm -hmm. We want to keep the complexity, but we want, don't want to have them complicated. Uh, and some of our older games needed quite some time to get into it. I, I would say Travian is probably not the most accessible game. Uh, you have to go through a lot in order to um, to succeed in the game. And we figured out that some people are just not willing to to take that obstacle anymore. They don't want to sit down and spend hours and hours uh, strategizing and learning. Uh, so what we want to make sure in all our games, and it's something that, that we talked about for, for Shout as well, is to make sure that players get into the game relatively easily but then experience the story, the the tactical elements, the strategical elements in the game, and uh, really have a lot of fun um, optimizing that and playing it over and over again. That is that is kind of our challenge, and a lot of others are trying the same thing. But we are trying it with a mix of external studios, uh, like uh, Polarium is right now, or Art and Craft is in in Austin but also with our internal um, developments uh, where we're trying to uh, you know, achieve the same thing and kind of uh, specialize on various different genres or um, type of games, I would say, in, uh, in our studios that we have. So you mean 
yeah, more or less uh, easy to learn, hard to master kind of games. I'm kind of avoiding that term, <laughs> but so that, that's it. I, I could say, yeah, <clears throat> the only reason I'm, I'm not saying this is because uh, it's so overused these days. Everybody's claiming, okay, it's gonna be easy to learn, hard to master. If we achieve that, you're right, that's that's what we're aiming for. Um, but we're, we're trying to make sure to not overuse that because I think some of the, some companies actually using that a lot and they didn't achieve it. It's, it's either hard to learn and hard to master, or it's easy to learn and there's no complexity at all to the game. Okay. Um, that's why we've just been a little more careful using it. But okay. yeah, the easy answer would have been yes. You know, and, 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 and since you're speaking of innovation, you know, one of the things uh, uh, that I think about the statements you, you made earlier of, uh, uh, you know, there are always, you didn't say always, but I'm, I'm adding the always, there's always more failures than successes. I mean, if you, if you look at our industry, we're still a hit-based industry. And I would argue that all art is hit based. I mean, if you're writing books, most you know most. If you picked a random book off the shelf, you probably wouldn't enjoy reading it. You know, you, there's a very small section of all books written that you would want to read. There's a very small section of all painted art that you would want to personally hang on your wall. There's a very small selection of games that you would want to personally say this is the game is for me. Uh, and uh, and as long as we're in the and, and I think the actual statistic is something like. You know, there's a thousand new titles or so that come out every year in any one segment, like on PCs or whatever. And there's the top 10 make a lot of money. And maybe the next 10 kind of break even. And then every, pretty much everything else is, you know, 980 games, you know, lose most all the money that's ever been put into them. And so it's important to try to, you know, get into that upper echelon. But the problem that a lot of the really large companies face, and any company that has, uh, you know, uh, two or three AAA mega properties that are putting, you know, a hundred million dollars into their frontline next release. You know, a, a game that only was in the scale of ones or tens of millions isn't enough to move their economics much. So they have to be shooting for hundred million dollar games. But if you invest a hundred million dollars game and, and it doesn't work, then you've blown a lot of money. And so a lot of those companies are sort of stuck in only making the sequels to their biggest properties because that's the only thing that's big enough to make a dent and it's the only thing that's, that's low risk enough not to squander such a big part of the bank. And so what I think we've come into as an industry is that it's actually the more entrepreneurial groups, these more mid-sized uh, companies, companies that have enough money to choose to tackle new problems and do some serious innovation and take those risks, that will still then, you know, that those risks they pay off are of a scale that's big enough to be relevant uh, and they can be managed tight enough to where if it doesn't work, they're, you know, not, uh, you know, going to put themselves out of business. And, uh, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, I've ended up moving back down to entrepreneurial size now twice in my 45 year career is to, is to get, get out of that trap of being part of such a big company uh, that uh, that they were completely risk averse. So money is killing innovation, more or less. Or yeah, the drag. Well, it's less that hit risk. Based, um, yeah, it's it away. You know? Yeah, it's it's this demand for AAA hits. Uh, if 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 that's your only method of of earning money. And by the way, I'm not knocking large scale AAA hits. I mean, uh, they're phenomenal to look at, and they're great fun to play. And you know, more power to the people that are, are, are building and sustaining those, those properties. Uh, I just think if you're looking for something new, if you're looking for something fresh, it's not likely going to come from the, uh, you know, mandatory to not fail, too big to fail. Exactly. Uh, this, this, you know, the, safe, the safe bet is missing. You know, if I would spend my money on investing in the game, the risk is low to get the money back if I invest in a GTA 6, GTA yeah. 7, you know. Right. Uh, beside having my money spent on a small developer with a huge innovation, blah, but the risk is high. So I think this is the the, the, the common sense, actually. Or but but I think what it also demands of you know even people like myself, you know, I, you know, if, if somebody would say, would I do I wish I had the budget to do both the innovation I would like to believe that I'm doing, but also do AAA art quality and stuff around it? Do I wish I had the hundred million dollars to blow to put into it? At some level, I'd go, yeah, I wish I had that money, of course. On the other hand, I know that having that money wouldn't 
make the game better necessarily. It may be more beautiful, it might appeal, it might give me some initial shelf space or initial visibility, but only if those innovations I do and if the gameplay itself is fun will it ultimately achieve success. So I don't think it I don't think the hundred million dollars uh, would you know substantially impact the probability of success. Uh, and so therefore it's probably better not to have it because uh, again for the same risk equation. So first prove that the innovation works. And if the innovation works, then start piling money into it. Then make sure, in, like in the case of Shroud of the Avatar, you know, make sure that episode two is not only more feature depth, but you know, feel free to go back and revise and, and and enhance all the fundamental engine mechanics and things that make the bells and whistles that you know make it more and more beautiful over time. That's actually the same philosophy we have at uh, at Trevi Games. We have many games going on, like nine mm-hmm. projects, including yours that we're working on right now. So most of them internal projects and some of them publishing projects. So um, that is, I think, the largest portfolio of uh, new games that we ever had in the history of the company. And uh, I'm super excited about those because I really believe in all those games that we make. There would be no point in actually investing money in them if we thought they're not going to work out, which was sometimes maybe the case in the past. And and I'm super happy that uh, that is not the case. But we couldn't even afford like a $100 million project. And even if we could, you have one shot. Right. It's, it's that game bad. or nothing. So right. if, 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 if you, it's, it's pretty <laughs> right. much all in, yep. you know. And uh, so this year, we're probably going to invest around $10 million, maybe a little less, into new games, new games alone. That is, for us, a lot of money. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that we're one of the companies that could actually afford doing that, but there's quite some risk to it. So um, we talked about Hit Ribbon. You know, we are perfectly aware that maybe two of those games, if we're lucky, are going to be doing really well. And there's maybe one or two more that are doing okay-ish. And I'm pretty sure there's a couple games, and I tell that to our employees too, that are not going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. They're probably going to get canceled along the way because it just doesn't make sense to complete them at some point. I hope that's not the case. We, we're working hard to finish all those titles. We believe in all of them right now. But hey, it's reality. And there's no point in hiding that. It's no point in believing that everything you do is going to work. So we, we better diversify a little bit and, and have a couple games that, uh, that we believe in that could actually be that next big thing that we are trying to, uh, to achieve. So, so when do you stop a project? Because we had a lot of other guests here that were talking about, yeah, we are, we are throwing 100 games out there and perhaps one is successful. Well, so. we don't do that because I really don't believe in it. The games should be meaningful. I mean, it's a valid strategy. Don't get me wrong. There's there's companies who release like 50 games or 100 games a year and uh, all small games. And some of them might work, some of them might not. And they pretty much don't give a damn which game it is. We care too much about the games we make that we uh, that would do that. Um, and uh, sometimes it scares me a little that we have nine games right now. That's so much for us. You know, it's uh, I, it was easier when we only had two or three. Mm. But the process is always going to be the same. How we define whether we continue with the game or not. I mean, let's let's distinguish between games that we are the publishing partner for, like Shout, for example. We could not or will not cancel a game like that unless it's you know, Rich and I both agree that. All of a sudden, you know, we don't believe in it anymore. I don't think that's going to happen. But so publishing is a slightly different thing. When we make that bet, if you will, when we invest in a title, that's usually when we say, okay, that we really believe in it and we're going to go through it all the way to the end. Um, for games that we develop ourselves, we have a process called the vision refinement process. Um, so every six or eight weeks, we uh, talk to the game teams. We have the game teams present the vision again. Um, and you might ask, like, why do they have to present the vision all the time? Uh, we actually do it, as, as the name says, refinement. Um, we want to make sure that we're always on track on where we want the game to be. So we want the game teams to present. If they think there needs to be a change to some elements of the vision, if they still true to the vision they had in the beginning, so we sometimes compare what we said last time and what, we do, what, what they present this time. And uh, that is, first of all, looking long term. So where do we want the game to be, like maybe a year from now, or by the time it's going to be released? Mm-hmm. And also more immediate, so what are we going to do in the next couple of weeks? So usually the next couple of sprints, the next three months, or maybe next six months or something. Um, and that is very important um, to calibrate, to see what the priorities should be. And we don't, usually don't tell them, we just want to know about them. We want to hear what they're trying to do. And only if there is something where we believe that is against the original vision of the game, that is against the company values, that never happened, but could be at some point, then we would say, hey guys, you gotta probably reiterate on that and, and figure out something else. So we introduced that process, I think in late 2016, tried it with a couple of games, and 2017 has been the first full year where we've done that process. And 
I love it. It's it's just amazing. So, it's a really good way of always getting together, talk about whether a game is still on track. And that would we don't intend that to be the end of a project if if we come to a point where nothing works at all, but it, it would be the trigger, to be fair. So if we talk about um, a game and the vision is not a match anymore with what we originally wanted to build and maybe the game design is, is somehow not contributing to that vision, then we would really have a separate conversation with the game team again and at some point uh, decide uh, what we want to do. With so it. you say we decide. Who is we then in, in those... Because we heard yesterday about uh, the, the sitting, the publishing round, or sales guy, or the marketing guys in the old days of publishers, and who is now the we decide that it's not going forward? On, it's, it's, and it's and the next, another question <laughs> is: Are you recording it so that you can see what you have done in the past to make a perfect? Yeah, I would say uh, report about. That's what you say at those time, and that's changed, and that's changed, so that everyone in the company can learn. Isn't it? Let me start from the last question you asked all the way to the <laughs> okay. So, recording no right now, but I actually like the idea. It would be kind of cool to see what we what we did in those meetings. When I say we, uh, I mean I got to be honest. We're not a democracy. This is not a process where uh, we're like I don't know ten people and six vote for it, four against it, and that's it. I don't believe in that. Period. I believe in what Richard said yesterday, there should be one vision keeper and there's always one guy on the game team who holds the vision. And I I think that for the most part, when something becomes very critical, it's usually my decision to challenge that a lot. So um, I see myself kind of as a vision keeper of what we do as a company. Um, so um, when I say we, is that's because we have a group called the Small Council. I, yes, I took that from Game of Thrones because I, I just like the way that works. People don't <laughs> die as much in our Small Council. <laughs> yes, I gotta say that. So I think they're yeah. still all there. Well, there's one. <coughs> <laughs> Where so there, I haven't seen him in months. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, now we we have that uh, that group of people, and the reason um, that's so important is because. I, I'm not going to make perfect decisions. There's no such thing as being perfect about that. Uh, market cha markets change. Uh, the circumstances change. Team uh, might change. So there's you can't react the same way all the time. Sometimes something I said like a year ago is is not applicable anymore. I have to change my opinion on something because I, I I learn every day. And everybody should learn every day. And that's why I'm saying it's important to have these guys there because they're experts in their field, usually the leads of their departments. And it's really important to get the opinion. But I think there should be someone making the final call. And that really in that case, and I'm probably going to uh, um, trigger like a discussion about that uh, within the community. When you get back to the office. Games community. But <laughs> the thing is, no, I really believe there should be someone making that call. So, and, But before I do that, of course, there's two founders in the company uh, that are not involved in any managerial functions. Um, but of course, I talk to them about it. If it comes to investments or or like discontinuing a project, then it's very important that I, uh, that I get the support. And uh, usually that is... That is not a big deal. I mean, we talk about this, and yeah, so it's, so it's a lot shorter sure. there. How many guys then? Because you didn't answer the question. How many guys in that in that in, group? To make the group to make the decision. Oh. Well, to be honest, to make the decision, it's, it's basically you. me. Um, okay. That's so why. I, that's why. That's why I didn't answer it. No, I said we because it's important that the other the guys also get the presentation more, yeah. that okay. they contribute sure. to that. So yes, if you want to be precise, I am actually the one usually making the decision. But I would never make a decision. So let's say there's um, six other people supporting me with that. Let's say they all say, "Oh my God, we shouldn't do that." Then I you would still say it. there there is a slight chance <laughs> that I might still say we got to do it because I strongly believe in it. But um, more often than not, actually, all the time, I, I trust the people. That's why I have them. If I, if I don't, uh, you know, take advice, and, then it doesn't make sense. And I was just going to throw in one item on there, too, which is, uh, while I agree with everything you've said, in, including the, you know, one person has to make a decision, but with uh, under consultation with the others and only overrule on when you think it's really important. Uh, one of the things we kind of derived you know, some time back Uh, that I, or at least uh, something my brother and I had as a policy that I still endorse to this day is, you know, we're, you're, while we're in a hit space business and, you know, we only found another great hit to kind of carry the company and grow the company for the next five years, about once every five years. I mean, you know, uh, found a title that was successful enough to sequel and sustain and do add ons and expansions and things for. And the most of the other titles were, you know, some broke even, some lost money, but they were all good attempts. One of the things we always felt, though, as a general policy was that 
you know, if you get into a game and halfway through you realize it's going to take twice as much time and twice as much money and you have less belief that it will achieve the great success that it did in the beginning, your temptation immediately is to start putting the brakes on it and either redirect uh, or just stop it altogether because your, your, your debate in the investment is, is going the wrong way. Uh, what we would usually say is we'd say as long as the time from here, as long as the investment from here to what we hope would really be the finish is not super out of balance. If we've just flushed the money that already came and as long as the money to finish to at least earn back the rest of it is close to even money, we would favor finishing it. Whenever possible, we tried to finish games. And our theory was, is that, you know, if you kill a game, the team is not going to necessarily believe it's their fault. They're going to believe that you, the managers, don't have faith in them. But, but if, they, if we'd only let them finish their game, they're sure it would have been great. And if you kill it, none of them learn what the finishing process is like. None of them learn what the shipping process is like. None of them see how the players receive it. If you ship it and it doesn't do as well, the team will know, yeah, my idea of the finished quality or the bug freeness or whatever was, whatever was weak, they will recognize that. And they'll internalize it, and they will be a, they'll be stronger individuals, and they'll be a stronger team for facing their next challenge. If, on the other hand, you kill it, not only will they be pissed, but odds are many of them will walk and go, you know, leave, literally leave the company and go somewhere else. And so we just think it's, when possible, finishing is better than abandoning. Okay. So things change in the, uh, from the past until now, as we have now games as a service, which is much more complicated, actually, in my opinion, to finance and uh, to go on and take a set and make this decision, okay, when to stop.